Dzień dobry. How's everybody going? All right, it's good to see you all. Um, yeah, so my name is Runar, uh, and uh, I'm going to start this conference by by talking to you about compositional programming. So when the organizers of this conference, our, our lovely organizers, asked me to give this talk, they asked me to talk about something practical. And so obviously I'm going to talk about category theory. I, ha I hear some laughter, but I'm actually totally serious. Um, category theory is, is very practical. Um, and and the, the practical aspect of category theory that I'm going to talk about is compositionality. Because category theory is really just the abstract study of compositional stuff. <clears throat> so, and, and it really pays its way in software through this idea of compositionality. Okay, so what is compositionality? So the definition I like is, is this one. Software, we say, is compositional to the extent that we can understand the whole system by understanding the parts and understanding the rules of composition. So the idea is that we construct software from modular pieces that we can individually understand that are meaningful on their own. And then if we understand those pieces and we understand how those pieces are put together, we understand the whole system. There's nothing outside of understanding the pieces and understanding the com composition that will inform our understanding of the system. So a compositional expression is going to be a nested structure, uh, or a compositional expression or program. And each part of this expression is going to mean something. It's going to have some kind of denotation or a meaning. Uh, and then the, the whole thing is going to mean something as well, and the meaning of the whole structure is going to be some combination of the meanings of the parts. To put that very tersely, the composition of the meanings is the meaning of the composition. Uh, and you'll note that there are actually two notions of composition here. There's a little bit of a pun. So, you know, I've made, I've put them in two different colors. Uh, <clears throat> so there's composition in the expression space, and then there's composition in the meaning space. Uh, so one is composition on structure, and another one is composition on interpretation, or you can think of it as syntax and then semantics for that syntax. But the idea of compositionality is that these different ways of composing, of composing structure and composing meaning, that they should mirror each other in some way. They should be structurally similar. <clears throat> and now, note that I'm saying compositionality. I'm not saying composability. Composability doesn't capture the idea that I'm trying to convey. Uh, composability is a, is a little bit of a weaker notion. Uh, it conveys the idea that something is able to be composed. Like if you write a lot of code, or like, you know, do a lot of JSON serialization or something. Um, but uh, compositional expressions are natively and fractally composable. Uh, they, they always are able to compose, and that is, in fact, the only thing they do. The only thing that compositional expressions do is compose. All right, so I'm going to give you a small example of, of this in Scala. So here is a program that I wrote. It's, uh, it's a totally awesome program. Uh, it's, it's not totally clear what it does just by glancing at it. Um, you have to kind of read it. <clears throat> but what it does is that it uh, reads a file as lines. So it's a text file. And then it splits the lines on word boundaries, and it, it uh, prints out the number of words in the file. Right, so it's not totally obvious. Um, <clears throat> so it's a perfectly fine program, but it is not very compositional. Uh, you'll note that the parts of this program are not complete in and of themselves. And to understand any one part of this, you actually need to have the whole program. You need to, to know what all the other parts are doing. And things that are logically connected are syntactically very far apart. 
And uh, I want to contrast this with a program that does exactly the same thing, but does it in a compositional way. So here's a program that does the same thing, but is using the FS2 library, uh, which is designed to be compositional. So this program is a lot shorter, uh, and the logic is very prominent. But more than that, uh, we can reason about this compositionally, because each part of this program is a meaningful expression, and then we can assemble the meaning of this whole program out of the meanings of those sub-expressions. So let's go through them one by one. The, uh, the first part here opens the file, uh, it emits the lines in the file as a stream of strings, and then it closes the file. So that's a meaningful thing to do on its own. And then the next part, takes any stream of strings, uh, splits it on word boundaries, and then turns that into a stream of words in those strings. And that'll work for any stream of strings. And so this part is a meaningful program also on its own. And then this, this part replaces every element of a stream with the number one. This part sums any stream of numbers and emits the sum on the stream. And this last part takes whatever is on the stream and prints it to standard output. All right, so there are a couple of things to note, uh, which is that the, the meaning of this whole expression is just a combination of the meanings of the sub-expressions. And the whole thing has the same character as the parts. All right, so the parts are streams, and the whole thing is also a stream. So it's just a, a combination of, of these uh, sort of stream combinators. And we can also reuse this in a larger system. So if we want to, uh, to, to reuse this program, it's, it's, a per it's perfectly meaningful to then compose other things with this. Um, I also want to point out that it's easy to verify. Not only is the logic very prominent, like it's, uh, it's easy to see it at a glance, uh, it's also the fact that the correctness of this program is composed of the correctness of the parts. So as long as the individual parts of this are correctly written, and that I've put them in the right order, uh, and you know the types line up, uh, and there's no bug in FS2, uh, then, then this whole program is going to be correct. It's going to work. Uh, and compositional reasoning like this about correctness becomes very important when we start talking about large systems. Uh, so we have no hope of reasoning about things like supply chains and, and complicated uh, systems like that uh, if we can't reason about them compositionally. Uh, for instance, in a, in a simple shopping cart application, you, know, if you, you would want to be able to conclude that if your shopping cart works and the payment system works, then any com composite of the shopping and the payments also works as expected. Uh, it would be very onerous to have to go and order every single product and then see if it gets delivered at the end. You know, this, this sort of integration testing at every single point. Uh, and so instead of that, what you want to be able to do is to just reason that each part is correct, that they are correctly assembled, and therefore the whole system is correct. So anyway, in the program that we had before, um, we had all these individual parts. That, that makes sense on their own. And in fact, we can pull those parts uh, away into individual components, and we can give each component a name that we can then reuse in some other program. Uh, so, so because this is compositional, it's also naturally modular. The, the program is literally a composition of these functions, print, sum, ones, and words, and it is a single function applied to uh, these, uh, sorry, it's sort of a composite function applied to, to this data. And in fact, we can write that explicitly. We can just say that the, the program is just f, some function f applied to the, to the lines stream, and the whole program is just a com composition of some functions. And this is, in general, what we want with functional programming. Uh, we want our entire system to be a single function applied to some input. 
<clears throat> because functional programming is really the study of compositional software. Because uh, functions are compositional. And the way that works is that if, whenever you have a function, uh, f, that goes from some type A to some type B, and then you have another function, g, that goes from the result type of that function, b, to some other type, c, then you always have a composite function, g compose f, uh, and that's always going to work, as long as, as, long as those uh, types line up and as long as the functions don't have side effects, which we'll get to in a moment. <clears throat> um, so yeah, the implementation of the function composition is just, well, apply the first function and then apply the second function as a result of that. And this is an example, this co composition here is an example of a category. <clears throat> All right, so now we're gonna get into category theory. Uh, so a category just consists of some objects. So you just think of it as some points in, in a space. And then there are some arrows between those objects, pointing from one object to another. So just think of this sort of as a graph. And then there's going to be a composition on the arrows, so that if you have an arrow from one point to another, and then a, an arrow from that point to a third one, then you have a composite arrow, a composition on those two arrows uh, from the first to the third point. And the composition has to be associative and have an identity. Uh, and I'm going to just uh, explain that with an example. The Scala category is an example of a category where the objects are Scala types. So you think of the points in the space as being types uh, in Scala. And the arrows between the types are Scala functions. So just va ordinary values, so, so actual functions, not, not function types, but actual functions. And the composition on the arrows is just function composition. And it is associative. That is, if we have three functions, f, g, and h, we can compose them. And it doesn't matter whether we consider the composite of f and g first or the composite of g and h first. And it has an identity. That is, there is an identity function, which is the, the identity arrow in this category. All right? So everybody now knows category three. Uh, so that there is another way that Scala is a category. So I just want to get you all thinking about uh, categories that are not function-like things. <clears throat> so, so in this category, the objects are still Scala types, but now the arrows are not functions, but subtype relationships. So there is an arrow from one type to another, from like, the type A to the type B, when A is a subtype of B. And then the composition on the arrows is just the transitivity relationship. So if A is a subtype of B, and B is a subtype of C, then A is a subtype of C. And the associativity is simply that it doesn't matter whether we reason that B is a subtype of C first, or A is a subtype of B first. And then every type is a subtype of itself, and so there's an identity arrow on every type. Cool, so that's, that's two categories already. Uh, let's take a simpler example of a compositional thing, the monoid. Uh, so a monoid is a special case of a category. Uh, a monoid is defined on some type M, uh, so it takes a type parameter, and it has two methods. And one of them is a binary operation called append that takes two M's and smashes them together. It composes them. And the other is a value which we're going to understand as the empty value, or the, the zero. So that's going to be the identity element. <clears throat> so yeah, monoid is, consists of some type, uh, an associative binary operation on that type, and then an identity element for that operation. And there are lots of examples of this. For instance, the integers with plus and zero, uh, the integers with multiplication and one as the identity element, uh, Booleans with and and true, or and false, uh, string concatenation with the empty string as the identity, uh, and then <coughs> function composition where the types are the same. Uh, so, so functions from a, some type A to that same type also form a monoid where the, the append operation is function composition and the identity element is the identity function. All right, so lots of examples of monoids. 
Um, another way of saying what a monoid is, is that it's actually just a category with one object. So that's, that's the same thing. A category with one object and a monoid are the same thing. Um, so, or we can also say that a category is like a monoid where not all the elements are compatible with one another. Okay, so in a monoid, there's only one object, the, the, the actual type M. And now the arrows are not function-like things. They're not relationship type things. They are values of that type M. And then the composition in this category, the composition on the arrows is the append operation in the monoid. So if we have one arrow four and another arrow six, we can compose those two arrows to get the arrow 10. And then the identity is the empty element or the, the zero. All right, and the, the arrowness of it is simply the direction in which you read the expression, like four plus six plus seven, you, you can only read it this way, it's not the same as reading it that way. Well, with plus, it's actually the same, but think of string concatenation, foo plus bar plus baz is not the same as baz, plus, yeah, you get the idea. All right, so monoids are super useful and practical in everyday uh, life. Uh, they're great for processing data. <coughs> Uh, and, and this is an example of where compositional reasoning really helps us. Uh, so imagine that this is a, a huge document. Like, imagine it's billions of pages long instead of just a slide. Uh, and we want to count the number of words. You know, this is a, a, a classic sort of MapReduce uh, problem. <clears throat> so we, uh, what we want to do is we want to divide and conquer. Like we want to break this down into smaller subproblems, and then we want to count the words in each subproblem, sort of in parallel, like do it all at the same time, and then at the end we want to compose our results. Okay. Uh, and so we want the result to be a monoid. That is, we we want to be able to compose the results at the end. Um, and we want to be able to compose individual subsolutions and then compose the, the subsolutions sort of in, in a tree until at the top we have the final um, answer. So we want this property that composing the results of the word counts of some strings should be the same as the word count of the composite string. All right, so the word count of the whole should be a composition of the word counts of the parts. Right, so whatever the word count function does, this WC thing, we want the result to be compositional. Um, and we need to be careful because we need to design our, our, our monoid in such a way that it allows for this kind of composition. So we want to design this compositionally. Uh, so we need to account for, for things like partial information. Like a thing that might happen is that we split the string in the middle of a word uh, and then we have to be careful that we track when we have seen a partial word at the beginning or the end because we don't know whether we have seen the full uh, word until we see uh, an actual word boundary, right? So the count function isn't going to know, for instance, uh, on the split between like the, the black and the red there. It's not going to know that vite is, is not two words. Okay, so we need to design it in, in, in that way. And what I've... What I've done is to just have it a triple, where I, uh, I have the count of w complete words I've seen in the middle, and then at the beginning and the end, I track whether I've seen a partial word or not. And the empty string represents that I did not see a partial word. Right, so we know that the whole string starts with lorem, then there are 39 whole words, and then we get a word boundary. Right? And then we just do this in parallel for all of the chunks, and we end up with word counts like this. And then at the end, we simply take our partial results two at a time, and we merge them. And the way we merge them is that we sum the word counts of the whole words we saw, and then if there are partial words in between, then we add one, because uh, you know, that's, that's now a complete word. All right, so we just do this until we end up with 196 plus one for the beginning word, and so 197 is the answer. <clears throat> so, uh, 
So uh, we want to design this in, in such a way that allows for compositional reasoning. Uh, and again, the property we want is that the composition of the word counts is the word count of the composite string. And we also want to preserve the fact that the word count of the empty string is zero. Right, so we want to have a, an empty in our monoid that is compatible with that. Um, so, so this property, this compositional reasoning, when we say compositional reasoning, we, actually, we usually mean homomorphism. So homomorphism is a precise way of, of saying this, that it preserves this kind of relationship. It is a mapping, so the word count is a mapping from the string monoid into the word count monoid that preserves the monoidness of it. So it, it is a monoid homomorphism. Homo means the same, morphe means shape, so homomorphism means it preserves the shape, it's the same shape. <clears throat> so this idea of homomorphism is sort of the, the central uh, idea of this talk, and really is the central idea of category theory. Another example of a monoid homomorphism, just to help you think about this, is, for instance, taking the length of a string. If you add the lengths of two strings, you should get the length of the composite string. So the length of the composition is the composition of the lengths. And then the length of the empty string should be zero. The, the identity is preserved across the mapping. So yeah, uh, homomorphisms are, are are central to the uh, to category theory, and I want to say that category theory is really just the study of homomorphisms. <clears throat> uh, and in fact, we have uh, a whole category of monoids, where the objects in that category are monoids, uh, and then the arrows are these functions, the the monoid homomorphisms that preserve the monoidness of the of the monoids. And then composition is function composition, uh, just ordinary function composition, and it happens to preserve the homomorphism uh, laws. And since monoids are just really small categories, uh, there is actually a category of categories, where the objects themselves are categories, and the arrows are category homomorphisms that preserve the categoriness of the, of the category. Um, and category homomorphisms are usually called functors. And the composition is then uh, functor composition. All right, so a functor from some category C to another category D takes every object in, in C and turns it into an object in D, or it gives you an, an object in D. And it takes every arrow between two objects in C to an arrow between corresponding objects in D. Uh, and the composition on the arrows and the identity are going to be preserved across this mapping. Um, a functor from a category to itself is called an endo functor, endo meaning within. And we're particularly interested in the uh, endo functors in the Scala category. Uh, so the category of Scala types and functions. So such a functor takes a type T, say, and it constructs the type F of T. And then on the arrows, you can see uh, in the signature of the map method, uh, it takes a function from A to B, so an arrow between the objects A and B, and it constructs a function from F of A to F of B, which is then an arrow from F of A to F of B. All right? And uh, it does it in such a way that it preserves this uh, composition. So it has to obser observe a homomorphism law. Uh, and you note that this is a lot like the situation with the word counts or the string lengths, uh, where the, the mapping of the composite function should be the same as composing the mapped functions. All right, so the composition is preserved across this mapping. <clears throat> and that allows us to do things like uh, map fusion and, and other awesome things like that. Uh, okay, an example of a functor in Scala is option. Uh, and the way that this functor works is that it, it uh, takes any function from A to B 
and it turns it into a function that operates on options. So we're from option A to option B. And the function uh, actually just operates on the A inside if it's there, and then it does nothing if it's, if it's not there. Um, and when we're talking about functions, we're really talking about pure functions. And, and compositionality really uh, breaks down uh, when a function has side effects. Uh, we want to actually track the effect in the return type of the function. And we use functors uh, to model effects in a, in a compo compositional way. Uh, for example, with option, the effect is that the function f might not have a b. Like it might return none. So this becomes a problem for composition because if we have the functions f and g that both return options, we can't compose them just with, with a compose or and then operator. Right, so, th so that doesn't work. The types don't line up. But we have a solution. We can, we can actually recover composition by ins instead of composing f and g, we compose f and a function that flat maps g over the result of f. Right, and we can actually capture that in a uh, function or a combinator, uh, which is greater than equals greater than uh, in like cats or scala z. Uh, and so now if we have the function f and we have the function uh, g, we can compose them in this way. And this something's called the fish operator. And so the fish operator takes, you know, the, uh, the incoming, uh, it gives you a, a, a composite function that takes the incoming a, it does f, and then it flat maps g over that. And so now <coughs> you have a function from a to option b, a function from b to option c, and that gives you a function from a to option c. Okay, so this is another example of a category, because now we're composing these kinds of arrows. Uh, and this is called a Kleisley category. So a Kleisley category in Scala is where the objects are Scala types. And then an arrow from A to B uh, is not going to be a function from A to B, but a function from A to option B, for instance. So this is the Kleisley category for option. And there's going to be a Kleisley category for different, ki different functors. And the composition is no longer ordinary function composition, it's Kleisley composition. So uh, it's implemented as uh, using flat map. And then the identity is going to be some operation that essentially just puts the value into the, the functor. All right, and whenever we have a Kleisley category like this, we have a monad. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, so in general, this, this should work uh, for, for, instance, for any functor m, whenever you have uh, a thing like this, then m is a monad. Um, <clears throat> and we can represent monads like this in, in Scala, uh, where we have to implement these two methods, flat map and unit, where flat map is going to be the implementation of our composition in the category, and then unit is going to be the implementation of the identity arrow in the category. And you'll notice that this obeys a homomorphism law, that the flat map of the composite function, f compose g, is the composite of the flat maps of the two functions f and g. And then the flat map of the unit is going to be the identity function. All right, so this is actually a functor from the Kleisley category into the ordinary Scala category. You can see that it takes, so the, the function h is an arrow in the Kleisley category, and then the result from m of a to m of b is an arrow in the regular Scala category. All right, so let's quickly talk about some things that prevent compositionality. So one of those things is side effects. Uh, and this example is, is from the book, uh, from, the, from the red book. Um, <clears throat> so for, for example, if you have an implementation of like a cafe, and then uh, somebody comes and buys a coffee and gives you a credit card, and you give them a coffee, and you have the side effect of charging their card. Uh, th this is not compositional, uh, because let's say they want to buy two cups of coffee, then now they have to give you the card twice, and you're going to charge it twice, uh, which is not what you want. What you want is to use some kind of symbolic representation that you can compose. 
uh, something like the notion of a charge, which captures the credit card and the amount to charge that card. And then you might want to have like a charge monoid, where you can have billions of charges, and then you could maybe consolidate them and group them by card, group them by credit card company, and other things like that. Uh, and so reasoning compositionally uh, will, will really help us uh, here. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so side effects uh, prevent this compositional reasoning or prevent us talking about homomorphisms. Because uh, you'll, you'll note that in this homomorphism law, that map of the composite function f and g should be the same as, mapping, uh, as, as the composite of mapping f and mapping g. Uh, this is not true in the presence of side effects. So if f and g have side effects, uh, for instance, if f and g print to the screen, the thing that's going to be printed to the screen uh, is going to be different uh, depending on whether you map once or map twice. For instance, if it's a list, you know, it's mapping twice is going to print out uh, twice as often. Okay? Um, <clears throat> another thing that prevents uh, composition is connected sequences. So whenever you have uh, a sequence of things where the meaning of each individual part uh, sorry, the meaning of the whole thing is not a combination of the meaning of the parts. So actually the meaning of any given part depends on the meaning of some other part. Uh, for instance, here is a, a, a x86 assembly program. Uh, and, and this program actually reads a character from the keyboard and echoes it to the screen. And it's totally non-obvious what this does. And if you just saw one of these instructions in isolation, you would have no idea what's going to happen. Right? And so, so you need the whole program in order to understand what any part of it is going to be doing. <clears throat> Another thing that prevents uh, composition is dependencies, where the meaning of one of the parts is actually uh, dependent on the meaning of some or, some or all of the other parts. Uh, for instance, in, in the chess notation. Chess notation is not compositional. Uh, where if you uh, see something like nd5, you, if you see that in isolation, you don't know what's happening. Uh, you don't know what moves have come before that. You don't know which player has moved. You don't know which knight they've moved, because knights may have two. You don't know whether it's a valid move at all, because they might not have any knights. <clears throat> uh, and so, in software in general, when we, whenever we have dependencies uh, like this, where meaning is dependent on something that either came before or comes after, uh, we are preventing composition. Uh, another thing that I want to say prevents, leaky, uh, prevents composition is leaky abstractions. Um, so for example, uh, representing SQL queries as strings is a leaky abstraction. Um, because let's say we want to compose this with some other SQL expression. Or let's say we want to modify it to you know, add some more properties to select, or add some condition to the where clause. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to do because we have to recover the structure of what the string is. All right, so we're working in a representation, uh, in the string representation, which is too big, in a sense. So it is uh, insufficiently precise and insufficiently abstract. But uh, <clears throat> more than side effects and things like that, I want to say that the, uh, the thing that prevents compositionality and our reasoning about software in general is entropy and perplexity. Uh, so entropy is the measure of how many configurations a system can have. And then perplexity is how difficult it is to predict the configuration that a given system is in. And both of these things, I think, are, are barriers to composition. So when we go from a low entropy, highly predictable structure to a high entropy, unpredictable structure, we lose information. Uh, we, we lose precision and we lose, lose abstraction. And therefore, we lose composition. <clears throat> so, um, for example, I don't know if everybody plays Minecraft, but uh, so this is your, your program uh, in a low entropy state. 
It's, you know, it's a, a well-contained little unit. You understand what this is. Um, and you can compose things in this low entropy state. Uh, it's, uh, it's highly compositional. You can make you know, all kinds of structures like this. And then at some point, you detonate this, and it goes to a high entropy state. And now there's no compositionality whatsoever. Like you've detonated your side effects, and uh, there's no composition anymore. It is in a high entropy, high perplexity state. So if this were our program, uh, we've lost the ability to extract meaning and then to compose that meaning with the meanings of other programs. Uh, and I want to say that entropy is the opposite of meaning. <clears throat> um, let's skip over this here. Yeah, so I want to say that uh, without compositionality, uh, language is literally meaningless. Right? It's, it's hi highly entropic and <clears throat> it has a lack of meaning. And this is not just, just with, with languages, but with software. Without compositionality in software, uh, our software is literally meaningless. Because you can imagine a language uh, that has no composition at all. Right? So, <clears throat> or imagine a library that has no composition at all, a Scala library. Uh, it's essentially a collection of unrelated, totally non-uniform, random things. Uh, and so th th there's no ambiguity, which is great, but there's no, no room for interpretation. And since there's no interpretation, there's no meaning. Uh, perplexity is maximized uh, in that it is impossible to predict the meaning of a string in such a language or the meaning of, of any expression using such a library. Um, so it, it would be literally meaningless if, if it had no composition whatsoever. But, but in real life, it's not all or nothing. There are extents and degrees. Uh, but I want to say that our programming, our software development, is to some degree meaningless uh, to the extent that we design without composition. So to the extent that we have connected sequences, interdependent clauses, uh, dependencies, leaky abstractions, side effects, things that make us feel uneasy about our software. <clears throat> so big wins of compositionality. Uh, the main big win is productivity, that we can understand things we've never seen before. Uh, we just try to understand the components, and then we assemble our understanding of those components into the, the understanding of the whole. Right? We just break the problem into subproblems, we solve the parts with some simple programs, and then we compose the solution from the smaller programs. Right? So we can solve problems that are completely uh, unfamiliar. Uh, and in this way, we can reason about really big systems and ideas, because we can you know, deconstruct the idea or the problem, and then reassemble the meaning or the understanding. Another big win is systematicity. We can systematically uh, reassemble things that we have. Uh, so for instance, if we understand both f of x and g of y, we also understand systematically f of y and g of x. And so if we can solve problems with any combination of p, q, and r individually, uh, we can solve any problem whose solution is any combination of PQ and R. <clears throat> and then uh, there's, a, there's a big win with, with uh, pragmatics. There's a pragmatic argument to be made here, which is that compositionality uh, works. If a system can be built at all, it can be built compositionally. And I want to say, actually, that compositionality is the only thing that works because it's really the only tool we have as humans to reason about larger and larger systems. We have to be able to break a thing down to things that we can understand and then reassemble our understanding from the understandings of those small things. And the final point I want to make is about aesthetics. Uh, programming compositionally is just really delightful. Uh, and I really want to emphasize this point. I, I think that we 
as programmers, we tend to overlook the human factors of, of programming. But um, I think that the joy of writing software is a really practical concern. I mean, it's the whole reason we're here. I, I bet that you didn't start programming because like, you wanted to maximize social utility or like, meet a deadline for the boss or something. Like, if you're anything like me, you started programming because programming is fun and exciting. Uh, and, and writing software using compositional components that neatly snap together uh, it just really amplifies that, that joy of, of programming. It's just a delightful way to work because it gets out of the way of you know, the, the, the joy of expressing our ideas in software. Uh, so part two of the, of the Red Book, I'm going to plug, plug, plug the book a bit here. Part two of the Red Book is kind of a tutorial on compositional design. And if you haven't gone through it, I encourage you to do so. Uh, and so yeah, I, I wrote this book with, uh, with my friend Paul. And Paul and I are actually currently working on a new programming language called Unison. Uh, and this is a purely functional programming language, which is built on these principles of compositionality. Uh, and Unison does things like recover compositionality across network boundaries. So you should be able to write an entire distributed system um, using just a single composite function that you run on some input, and it deploys your system. Anyway, that's a, a different talk. Uh, keep an eye out for, for Unison. We're really excited about it. Uh, so I just want to leave you with the thought uh, that if you design with compositionality in mind, I think you'll find yourself writing more delightful, more meaningful code. Thank you. <laughs>